you so much for being a part of our services at GNG this morning, whether online or in person. It is such a blessing to be worshiping with all of you. My name is Annie Rankin and I serve as an usher, and I personally want to welcome all of you. This morning, before we begin the service, we wanted to take a moment to let you know about some things that are coming up here at GNG. Today, we are continuing our annual God on Film series. This is a fun series during which we analyze biblical themes arising out of famous films. This is a great series to invite friends to come. As you entered the building, you probably saw the large popcorn bins full of popcorn bag invitations. Feel free to grab several of those so that you can pass them out when inviting your unchurched friends and family. One of our biggest annual outreach events every year is Roots, and we are only a few weeks away. Roots is G&G's annual celebration of God's gift of music. Every year we take an entire weekend to deliver the message of Christ using unique and interesting music of all different styles. Roots 16 will take place on Friday, November 6th at 7.30, Saturday, November 7th at 3.30 and 7.30 p.m., and Sunday, November 8th at 10.45 a.m. The band, dance, and programming teams have been hard at work planning this series, and Route 16 is going to be a ton of fun. If you want to help with Roots, there are a few important ways that you can do that. First, pray for Roots, for the health and well-being of all involved, and for those who will be coming, that God will prepare their heart for the message they will see and hear in the service. Two, as you exit the auditorium today, there are Roots invite cards that you can take and pass out to your unchurched family and friends. Feel free to take as many as you like and use them. We would love to see as many people as possible be a part of Roots 16 this year. Third, and finally, one great way of helping us prepare for Roots is to help us with our upcoming fall clean on Saturday, October 31st from 9 a.m. to noon. Bring your family, your life group, or some friends, and help us make sure that the building is ready and to make a good impression on those who visit us for Roots. Today is going to be an awesome day to be here at G&G. Thank you for being here this morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Good News Gathering. We are so glad to see you here. And would you please, please uh, rise up and we will praise the Lord. Let everything change to be bound about my faith in you. I 
church. You know, with all the news and everything that's been going around lately, we decided this morning we were going to keep this one a little up-tempo, okay? So we're, we're, we're going to rock a little bit. This next song, um, this next song with everything going on, obviously, is called Reaching For You, and obviously it explains a hundred times over, Jesus, we need you.
Lord, we are so, so blessed to be able to come here today and praise you with our voices. Please open our hearts, our minds, as we prepare to learn from your word. In your name we pray, amen. Before we jump into today's lesson, take a moment and look at the Connect card, which is a card in the bulletin you grabbed on your way into the auditorium. If you're a regular attender, fill out your card with comments, questions, prayer requests, or if you have a change with your contact information. 
If you're a first time guest, we're glad you're here. Please take a few moments to fill out as much information as you feel comfortable sharing. Don't worry, we won't show up at your house or call you unless you specifically ask us to. When you take it to the Welcome Center, you'll receive a free gift. This is also an opportunity for you to meet our teaching pastor, Jeff Lyle, who will be happy to say hi when you stop to pick up your free gift. If you are watching online, go to our website and click Connect to fill out the Connect card. If you're a second time guest, please fill out the card and take it to the Welcome Center. We have something for you as well. Thanks again for joining us. Now, prepare to engage your minds as we read and learn from God's Word. There are moments in life where we simply can't agree to disagree. When you can't just go with the flow. When you can't turn a blind eye. There are moments when even if it costs you everything, your conscience simply won't allow you to believe something you don't. Or make excuses for the inexcusable. Such moments appear in different ways and at different times for all of us, but they inevitably come for us all. In the early 1500s, just such a moment came for Sir Thomas More. Thomas More was one of the most brilliant scholars and statesmen in all of Britain during the 1500s. Starting as a parliament member in 1504, he rose to prominence as a member of King Henry VIII's Privy Council in 1514. His rise was meteoric, and he was widely considered one of the most influential men in all of Britain at that time. He was also a devout Catholic. And it was his faith in Christ and an unbending devotion to the Catholic Church that would lead Thomas More to his take a stand moment, vividly portrayed in the 1966 movie, A Man for All Seasons. When the movie begins, Henry VIII is married to Catherine of Aragon, to whom he has been married for almost two decades, but she's been unable to produce for him a son. In his desperate attempt to have an heir for the throne, Henry has cast a wandering eye on Anne Boleyn. King Henry was determined to have his marriage to Catherine annulled by the Pope in Rome so that he would be free to marry Anne. And King Henry put his Lord Chancellor, the highest appointed office in all of Britain, a man by the name of Cardinal Wolsey, on the task of getting the Pope to agree. But Thomas More was one of the influential members of the council, and he did not agree. And in a conversation with Cardinal Wolsey, he indicated that he refused to help the cardinal seek the king's divorce. Think about what's going on. The cardinal, a man of God, a man tasked with the responsibility to help people know and follow the word of God, says to Thomas More, are you going to help me? Certain things are regrettable. Yeah, it's bad that Henry wants to divorce his wife and move on to some other woman that might bear him a son. That's bad. That's not good. Yeah, I know. But, but we really need this to happen so that we avoid wars and we avoid all these other things. We, we really need to get this pushed through. Did you notice Thomas' response? He says, you know... I think that when statesmen forsake their own private conscience, in other words, when they go against their very foundational beliefs to do their public duty, they lead their country on a short route to chaos. In other words, no, I won't help you. Because to do that would be to violate what he believed. And what was it that Moore believed? Number one, he believed that Henry's pursuit of an annulment and remarriage to Anne Boleyn was driven only by lust and political maneuvering. That's bad enough. That's not just regrettable. That's evil. 
But secondly, Thomas More believed that Henry had no right to make such a change without appealing to the Pope. You see, for Thomas More, the Pope was God's representative on earth, and Henry needed his approval to do something like that. Now, the reality is, you may disagree with Thomas More on that matter. I personally do. But the reality was, that's what he believed. And that's what he stood for. Now, as history records, Wolsey was not able to get the Pope to agree. In fact, the Pope denied Henry the right. So Henry removed Wolsey from his role as Lord Chancellor and promoted Thomas More to the role. And Thomas took the role despite his disagreement. And, and this was a point of tension for him and Henry for the time that he was the Chancellor. For a time, More attempted to sidestep the issue, focusing on other things, downplaying his disagreement, remaining silent as he could. But Henry became more and more forceful. Eventually, through an act of parliament, he broke from the Catholic Church and deemed himself the supreme head of the Church of England, taking upon himself a title conferred by his parliament, but in Thomas More's opinion, not by God. Henry would go on to remove Catherine from her role as queen, and he married Anne Boleyn, and this Thomas More would not suffer. He resigned from his post as the Lord Chancellor and refused to attend Henry's wedding. As time progressed, Henry mandated that everyone take an oath to acknowledge his status as the supreme head of the church. Thomas More refused, and he was imprisoned and charged with treason for his trouble. Now, because of More's popularity and fame within the country, the king and his advisors felt it politically expedient to try to goad him into changing his mind, to apply pressure, as Wolsey had said, to get him to think otherwise. And they did so by sending his family to his jail cell to try to change his mind. Some men are capable of that kind of compromise. To take themselves in their hands, deny their convictions for what's politically expedient. And he says some very powerful words. I'd be loath to think your father is one of those kind of people. In short, I would hate to give that kind of example to you and everyone else. Thomas More was ultimately tried, convicted, and executed. And when you think about it, it all comes down to one thing. A religious disagreement with the king. He was beheaded because he had a difference of opinion about religion with the wrong person. This morning we're in the third week of our annual God on Film series, and this God on Film is built around a particular theme. We're calling it, We Hold These Truths, Borrowing from the Declaration of Independence. And during this series, we've been looking at the foundational biblical principles that guided the founding of the United States of America. And during this lesson series, we've been using the words of Jesus in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32 as our focus first. It's going to come up on the screens. I'd like you to recite this with me. Here we go. If you hold to my truths, you are really my disciples. Sorry about that. <laughs> then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And what, what's he saying? Notice this. Jesus is saying it's only by hearing and holding the teaching of Christ. It's only by hearing and holding the teaching of Christ that we know the truth. Now think about this. Now, you can believe in anybody you want. You can pick any kind of teacher that you want. You can chase after anybody's ideas that you want. But he says, it's only when you hold to my teaching 
that you're actually holding the truth. He says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, not free from hardship or trouble. Those are realities of our world. So from what are we set free? Free from the consequences of sin, namely a godless eternity. And free from the worry and fear of being separated from God. And I think it's interesting that the first generations of Americans picked up on this idea of freedom being found in the Word of God. A man named Horace Greeley, the founder and editor of the New York Tribune newspaper, which during the 1800s was one of the most widely distributed newspapers in America, made this observation. He said, it's impossible, I want you to notice this, he says, it's impossible to enslave mentally or socially a Bible reading people. Just think about what we've been through for the last eight months. (laughs) He says, it's impossible to enslave a Bible reading people. There are certain people, in his case, who read the Bible, who simply will not be enslaved, who simply feel at the core of their being that they have a right to live and do as they feel led by God. He says, the principles of the Bible are the groundwork for human freedom. You see, Greeley recognized that a person who reads and believes the Bible believes in the words that guided America to become the freest nation on the history of the earth. Greeley believed what our founders knew, that to become a follower of Christ made one free regardless of their station in life or the difficulties they faced. And I'll be honest, just, this is just me reflecting on my own life. Growing up in America, I felt like religious freedom was an absolute given. Right? I mean, of course, everybody has the right to worship any way that they want. It's America. <laughs> I mean, there, there are not only many kind of Christian denominations out there that prove this point beyond all reasonable doubt, but, but the, the, the corollary truth is this. There are people from literally every religion under, under the sun that call America their home. So, of course, we're allowed to worship however we want. It's America. So, stories like Thomas More's feel a little weird to us, right? I mean, as Americans, we, at least I, I grew up with this sense that, yeah, you may disagree with somebody else's faith, but you don't get to kill them for it. Right? That doesn't happen. We're free to worship how we want. But see, for our founders, this was not a given. Religious freedom was not a given. In fact, religious persecution was a very real and very central issue to the founding of this nation. As perhaps you know, the first settlers that came to America's shores were largely here in escape of religious persecution. The pilgrims and Puritans who came to America came in pursuit of a freedom to practice their faith as they saw fit. Because all across the European continent in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, religious wars were the rule, not the exception. And the barbarity with which Christians treated one another is astounding. An archbishop in Austria expelled a bunch of Protestant Christians in the middle of winter, removing them from their homes with eight days' notice. Many of them froze to death, searching for somewhere else to live. Protestants in France engaged in systematic execution of Catholic priests, literally ripping out their internal organs with a stick. In Ireland, 
Catholics drown Protestants from a bridge. Even Thomas More, admittedly, persecuted Protestants. He had them jailed during his time as Lord Chancellor. You see, make no mistake, like our founding fathers, there are admirable things about Thomas More's life, but he was not perfect. The history of religious persecution all throughout Europe had a profound impact on our founders. And they set out to create a system in which Americans could practice their faith freely and without concern of oppression from the government. So I just want to tell you up front what we're going to do today. First and foremost, I want to, I want to kind of answer three questions. First one is, what is the biblical foundation of freedom that Horace Greeley was talking about? Where do we get this idea of religious freedom from the text of Scripture? Secondly, what were the laws that our founding fathers enshrined in order to protect that religious freedom? And then thirdly, how do we deal with our religious freedom? What do we do with it? So let's begin by asking the question, what was the biblical foundation for the idea of religious freedom? And my guess is that it will surprise you very little to figure out that Jesus was the primary example of religious freedom for our founding fathers. As we read the New Testament accounts of Christ, something clearly pops out. Unlike the popes and the kings of Europe who used religion as a, as a stick, a political stick to shake at their opponents during the bloody European religious wars. Jesus didn't convert people that way. We see in the Gospels that instead Jesus used personal invitations, teaching, and his own example to make disciples. Jesus never used and never taught force as an appropriate disciple-making method. Now, there's a lot in that sentence, and I just want to take a moment to break it down. When it comes to making disciples, one of the ways that Jesus did that most regularly was through the simple personal invitation. In fact, that's how he snagged a couple of his most famous disciples. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, Peter, any of you who have been in church for a long time have heard that name and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. A simple, personal invitation. And think about what he said. He said, come, follow me, an invitation, and I will send you out to fish for others. Another invitation, right? I'm inviting you so that you'll go out and invite others. No threatening them. <laughs> Follow me or I will destroy your business. No. <laughs> Just follow me. No putting them on the rack. None of that. Just a simple invitation. But he also used his example and his teaching to guide and direct those who follow him. Notice his final words to the apostles, which we know as the Great Commission. He says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Literally speaking, Jesus is saying, because I died and resurrected from the dead, I am now the most powerful being in all of the universe. All authority. This guy. <laughs> Therefore, go and make disciples by imprisoning those who don't believe in me. That's not exactly what it says. Okay, let's try again. Therefore, go and threaten to murder all of those who interpret my words differently than you do. Not quite. Therefore, make disciples by waging war against those who believe in other gods. Not what he said either. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing, circle that word, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching, circle that word, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Baptize and teach. 
baptize and teach. Here's the thing. That was what Jesus did. He and his disciples traveled around. He taught, and they baptized people. (laughs) That's what they did. That's what they did. His example, invite and be an example. Invite, be an example. That's how you make disciples. In fact, Jesus went so far as to avoid even using his miracle working power to overwhelm people in unbelief. Right? Jesus avoided using on demand miracles to overwhelm people into unbelief. He avoided this. Now, this is a fascinating circumstance, but I want you to notice this. This is Matthew chapter 12. This interesting moment happens. Some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law come to him and they say, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now, the background of this is simply they didn't believe in him, they were coming to check him out. They were coming to test him. They were coming to figure out how they could prove he wasn't who he said he was. And so they come and they say, we want to see a sign from you. Show us something amazing. Show us something impossible. Show us something we can't deny, Jesus. Go ahead. Prove it. Prove it. Prove your God. And guys, By now, in his ministry, he's healed dozens of people. He's healed dozens of people. He's made the sick well, the blind see, the lame walk. He's done done it all, and he's done it all already. And they're like, no, 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 we, we want to see something else. Prove it to us, Jesus. And look at what he says. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. You're only here because you don't believe. You haven't taken one look at all the other things I've already done that prove that I'm the Son of God. He says, no, no sign will be given to you. I mean, Jesus tells him no. And I think the reason he did is this. When Jesus worked miracles for people, his purpose was to actually help those people. His purpose was to help those people. You got a blind person in front of you. Think about the sick and the blind and the demon-possessed people he healed. His purpose when he healed those people was not, well, if I heal this one, then they'll believe that I'm the Son of God. That's, so that's why I've got to do it. No, he was just healing these people. Now, let me, there's a little nuance here. We've got to think about this. Did his miracles prove that he was the Son of God? Of course they did. Of course they did. Of course, that's one of the convincing proofs for Jesus being the Son of God, that he healed people, that he worked miracles, and all that kind of stuff. Of course. But was that what he was after when he did it? No. He was after helping those people. So when the Pharisees basically come to him and say, Jesus, we'd like to see some kind of cosmic parlor trick to prove that you're the Son of God, he says, no. No. And he goes on, he says, None will be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You want to see a sign? Wait till I get back up from the dead. You don't believe that? You just don't believe me. (laughs) You see, Jesus wasn't trying to override the will of the people that he met. He invited them, he taught them, he showed them that he was the son of God by his miracles and by his example, but he didn't force people to believe in him. He gave them the opportunity, but he also respected their choices. So some believed and many did not. There are examples in the scriptures of people that walked right up to Jesus and he very clearly said, you can follow me or not, and some didn't. Jesus offered people the opportunity to leverage their religious freedom to believe in him or reject him. So our founding fathers saw in Jesus an example of someone exercising religious freedom and allowing others to exercise it as well. But they also saw explicit examples of religious freedom inside of the church. You see, the early church taught and practiced tolerance and grace regarding matters of personal conviction. 
See, the church made room for different choices about certain aspects of the Christian life. One of the best examples of this is in Romans chapter 14, the Apostle Paul writing to a church in Rome. This is what he says, accept one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Now, there's three very important elements of that sentence. Let's break it down. He says, first and foremost, accept. You might circle that word, accept. This this indicates that, that the church was to be accepting of one another. So the question that begs is, well, what were they to accept? Second phrase, the one whose faith is weak. Circle that phrase, faith is weak. Now, I want you to circle it. We're going to move on. I'm going to come back to it in just a second. He says, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over, circle this phrase, disputable matters. Disputable matters. In other words, what Paul is saying is that there are some things in the life and practice of the church that are really, 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 really important. Like nobody gets to disagree about these things. And then there are some things that are disputable matters, right? So for Paul, let's just, let's, just kind of, let's just kind of walk through this. If you want to be a called Christian for Paul, you would have had to believe that Jesus was the Son of God, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died for our sins, rose from the dead. For Paul, that was like entry level. You don't believe that, you're really not a Christian. But then there were other things that you didn't have to agree about. There were some disputable matters, and he gives an example. Notice, he says, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose, circle this phrase, there it is again, faith is weak, eats only vegetables. What's going on here? Well, within the church at Rome, there are different kinds of people. There were Jews, and then there were non-Jews, what the Bible calls Gentiles, right? Right? The Jews, because of their cultural history, typically adhered to kosher food laws of the Old Testament. The Gentiles did not. Now, the clear teaching of both Christ and the apostles throughout the New Testament is that that Christians, because of the sacrifice of Christ, were free to eat whatever they wanted, right? There was freedom for Christians to practice any kind of diet you so chose. But many of the Jewish Christians, the Jewish converts to Christianity, willfully withheld that freedom in their own lives and chose, because of their culture and because of their history, to continue operating by the old kosher Jewish food laws. So for Paul, when he says a person of weak faith, what that what that means is not, well, they only, they only trust Christ a little, or they only believe God can do certain kinds of things. That's not, that's not what that means. What it means is their weak faith, they are exercising only a little bit of the freedom that they have in Christ. Whether by cultural or just personal desire, they have limited themselves in the freedom available to them in Christ. And what Paul says, notice this, right? He says, about Christians of different dietary persuasions. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Simply put, let them do what they want, even if you disagree with them. Oh, so you're a Gentile, and and you think you can eat whatever you want. Don't go looking down on the Jew who restricts his diet. You're a Jew who restricts your diet. Don't go judging this person who eats whatever he wants. He says, leave them alone. Allow them to exercise their religious freedom. Now, there's obviously a limit to this, guys. Paul would not have had the same attitude if another person were practicing something sinful or believing something that the Bible clearly calls false, I mean, he would have, he would have absolutely challenged and redirected that. But, but as it pertains to these disputable matters, he said, let people have religious liberty. Let them do what they want. You do what you want. I mean, let, me, let me give you an example. One of, one of the kind of important issues in, in kind of modern church situations is, is a practice that we call communion, Right? 
taking the bread and the, the, the cup and, and, and eating that and reminding ourselves of the sacrifice that Christ has, has, has engaged in on our behalf. But when you look at the Bible, there is no one place that demands that every Christian take it on a certain amount of time or a certain day or a certain situation. Now, there were certain things that the apostles did with that and certain things that other churches did with that, but there but there's no one place in the Bible where it says this is how you must take communion. And so churches over the centuries have, have gradually migrated to different issues. Some, some people take it every week. Some people take it once a quarter. Some people take it once a year. Some people take it once in life. And you know, when there's no clear biblical injunction as to how often you take that, there's freedom. And what Paul would say to a Christian is, let them take it when they want to take it. And you take it when you want to take it. And don't make a big deal about it. In fact, he goes on to say something that that is not only a powerful point in this section, but it's, it's the title of our lesson today. He says, who are you to judge someone else's servant? There are some things in this deal that nobody gets to disagree about, but there are some things in this that people can feel free to kind of argue and debate about. There are some, peop- there are some things in the Christian life and the Christian faith that are disputable matters. In such moments, allow people to have the freedom that God has given them. He says, to their own master, they will stand or fall. Our job isn't to judge another person's spiritual decisions. Unless the Bible forbids what they are doing, we should leave them alone. Paul says, God will take care of rewarding or punishing the behavior of another person who claims to be a follower of Christ. Give them the liberty to do as they will, just as they give you the liberty to do what you will. Now, when you take all of this together, right, the the history of religious oppression in Europe alongside the example of Christ and the teachings of the early church, it provides a foundation for the idea of religious liberty, religious freedom. And this combination of factors profoundly impacted our founding fathers. And they deeply desired to create a nation where people were free to worship according to the dictates of their own conscience. They didn't want anyone or anything to have the power to curb free religious expression in this nation and in the lives of the individuals that comprised it. Now, for a moment, I want to go back to something we talked about in week one. If you were here that week, you'll remember this diagram. We talked about how the founding fathers believed that there were three primary social institutions in the nation that were of major importance. One, the family. Two, the church. Three, the state. Right? And our founding fathers saw each of these as playing a vital role in society, and while there was certainly a little bit of overlap in their responsibilities, each of them had their own distinct sphere of influence. For example, the church had no right, nor the government, in fact, had no right to come into the family and say, this is how you need to operate your family. Like, think of, it, think of how ridiculous it would be if I walked into your house and said, you know what, you need to move the plates from that cupboard to that cupboard, and this really shouldn't be the dining room. And by the way, put your kids to bed at 8.30. Like, it'd be ridiculous. And I'm, I'm sure you would very lovingly say, buzz off. Right? You would. Right? The same if a politician walked in your house and tried to do the same thing. Similarly, right? Individual families don't have the right to tell the church how to operate, nor do they have the right to to write laws that everybody else has to obey, right? There are distinctions between these spheres. Each sphere is responsible to the others in certain ways, and each is free from the others in certain ways. That's That's by design. And for our founding fathers, the greatest concern they had was that the state would exert undue influence and curb religious freedom upon the church and the family. So they wrote the First Amendment to the Constitution to ensure that didn't happen. And I want to just read this with you. 
this morning. The First Amendment of the Constitution goes like this. Congress shall make no law, circle that phrase, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Effectively, what it's saying is this. The state or the government doesn't get to say, like Henry VIII did, that everyone in this country is going to be a Protestant Christian. That's what Henry VIII did. He said, nope, we're no longer following Rome, following me. Everybody's a Christian. Everybody's a Protestant Christian. Ain't Catholic anymore, (laughs) right? The state doesn't have the right to do that in the United States of America. It it doesn't have a right to establish a religion that everybody else has to adhere to, right? Congress shall make no law. Second phrase, nor prohibit the free exercise thereof. So not only can the government not set a religious standard that everybody has to adhere to, the government doesn't have the right to come into your life or into your church and say, no, no, can't do that. Yeah, yeah, can't believe that. Nope, you can't think that. See, the state doesn't have the right to do that in the United States of America. Simply put, the government doesn't have the right to tell you what you can and cannot believe. You see, our founders believed in the separation of the church from the intrusion of the state, not the separation of the state from the influence of the church. I'm going to say that again. (laughs) The founders believed in the separation of the church from the intrusion of the state, not the separation of the state from the influence of the church. Let me prove this to you because I'm sure there are some of you out there going, well, JD, separation of church and state, what are you talking about? Yeah, I I think you're on dicey ground here. I don't believe so. You see, in our world, we hear a lot about the separation of church and state. And what it's come to mean over the last couple of decades is that the state needs to be free from all influence by the church. In fact, you saw this on full display if you watched the Supreme Court nominee hearings over the course of the last week, right? Right? There is a Supreme Court nominee up for nomination right now who is very staunch Catholic and incredibly pro-life, all right? And now whatever your thoughts are about that, the reality is if you watch those hearings, for some of the senators engaged in those hearings, that was a big, big issue. They were, and they voiced incredible concern, and in fact, they voiced that they would not vote for this individual because of her religious stance. But there's a problem with this. You see, the problem is the point of the First Amendment was not to keep religious people from engaging in government. The point of the First Amendment was to keep the government from limiting religious freedom. Notice, if you look back on the words of the First Amendment, that all of the limitations expressed in the First Amendment are on the government, not the church. I mean, read it for yourself. All of the limitations expressed in this document are on the government, not the church. Congress shall establish no religion. In other words, Congress can't make a religion the only religion in the state. Congress shall not limit the free exercise of religion. All of the provisions in this amendment were intended to protect the people as they practice their faith. and to even bring their faith with them as they engage with government, right? Regardless of what you think about the Supreme Court situation or the Supreme Court nominee herself, the reality is the First Amendment was not designed to remove her faith when she walks into office. The First Amendment was designed to protect her from the government taking it away. But it wasn't just Congress. Alexander Hamilton noted in Federalist number 68 of the Federalist Papers that the President of the United States, notice this language, it's going to come up on the screen here. He says, the President of the United States has no particle of spiritual jurisdiction. (laughs) I think that language is amazing. That the President doesn't have one ounce of religious sway over your life and over this country. You get to believe what you want to believe, and the President of the United States can say nothing about it. 
And I want you to notice something else about the First Amendment. Let's, let's continue reading it. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging or limiting the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble or to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, this is an important question and I want you to think about it. Why did they put all of those other rights in with the right to religious freedom? Why did they do that? Well, the answer is very simple. The freedoms of speech, press, assembly, and grievance redress are necessary for the freedom of religion. They're necessary for the freedom of religion. Let me, let me prove this to you. In order to truly have freedom of religion, you have to be free to speak about what you believe. One of the great lies happening in America right now is, oh, you're free to be whatever you want religiously, but just don't tell anybody. That's garbage. If you're free, you have the right to say it. <laughs> you have the right to encourage other people to believe it. Right? Without the freedom of speech, you don't actually have a freedom of religion. It's the same with the freedom of the press. Think about that. Without being able to write about and publish your beliefs, are you really free to believe what you believe? No. That's why they gave us the freedom of the press, so that we could write about and encourage others to think about our Christian ideas. That's why. Think about it. You don't truly have a freedom of religion if you don't have the right to peaceably assemble just like we are now. If, if, if you're allowed to believe whatever you want to believe, but God help you if you get together with anybody else who thinks the same way, that's not freedom. <laughs> that's not a freedom of religion. And see, the thing about this article in the, 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 the Constitution is that it wasn't just for protests. We hear a lot about protests in our nation right now, and God bless it. God bless that we have the right to protest government action and all those kinds of things. That's, that's awesome. But make no mistake, a big part of the right to peaceably assemble was to allow churches to meet together. And there are some places in our country right now where by executive order that freedom is being curtailed. You see, for our founders, the right to peaceably assemble was critical for ensuring the freedom of religion. Finally, in order to truly have a freedom of religion, you must have the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances if the government attempts to limit or control one's religious faith. So if they try to tell you what you can and can't believe, in order to truly have freedom, you have to be able to go to the government and say, I don't think you have the right to do that. And I'd like you to rule on this <laughs> because you said I have these rights. You see, when you take all this together, the purpose of all the rights enumerated in the First Amendment was to support religious freedom. Now, I have to say this because it's true. All of the rights enumerated in this First Amendment to some degree or another stand on their own. So you don't have to be religious to have freedom of speech or press or any of those kinds of things. That's true, but the primary reason for ensuring that you had all of these other rights was to prop up and support the freedom of religion. So I just wanna take a couple moments and I wanna think about this final question. What is our response to the freedom we have? How do we live? How do we deal with this freedom of religion enumerated in our Constitution? Let me just give you some quick ideas. First and foremost, live the freedom you have. Live the freedom you have. Practice your faith. Take advantage of the fact that you get to go to church. Take advantage of the freedom you have to read the Bible, to learn what it says, to do what it says. And for heaven's sakes, don't be afraid to express your opinion. You are free to have it. You're free to have it. I just want to say this to all of you right now. 
Whatever you think about religious matters in the United States of America at this moment, you are free to have that perspective. Nothing and no one gets to take it from you. So live it. You know, I think our founders would be shocked that we're becoming a people who value not liberty and equality, but control and uniformity. I think, I think if they were actually able to wake up and see America as it is today, there would be a lot of the issues with what they saw. They would have a lot of issues with what they saw. I mean, they would be shocked that because of the power of social media and of an often condemning press, that Americans are gradually conforming to societal norms of belief rather than feeling free to practice their faith as they see fit. I mean, I have done it to myself. I've talked, I've, 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 I've absolutely censored myself in conversations, on social media, in lots of areas of, I've like, and I'm, I'm just being honest with you, I've actively censored myself because of what other people might think. And the founders are like, why? You're free. Do what you want. Think what you want, believe what you want, go to church where you want, post what you want. Now be smart. I mean, wisdom has to play a little bit of a factor in this, but you're free. Live your freedom. Guys, the truth is, I may not agree with you about some point of theology. You may not agree with me. So? That's all right. You get to live the way you want to live and think the things you get to think. I get to do the same. As long as we're peaceable about it, that's why we have religious freedom. Figure out what you believe and then go live it. And, and for heaven's sakes, don't spend a lot of time worrying about what other people think. Secondly, and this is real for us right now, I think we need to avoid the cancel culture mindset. We need to avoid the cancel culture mindset. This is really dangerous, and it's happening in our culture right now. There's this trend where if somebody has beliefs that don't fit with the main cultural norms, they get canceled, right? Their speaking engagements get canceled. Their books get banned. Their shows get turned off. They get, their videos get flagged as dangerous by Twitter and Facebook. Here's the deal. Don't buy into that. Don't buy into that mindset because Jesus didn't even buy into that. Let me give you an example. Right? This is from Mark chapter 9. Jesus is walking around with his apostles one day, and his apostles see some guy that wasn't one of them, out there, and he's casting a demon out of the guy, and he's using the name of Jesus to do it. And so the apostles waltz up to this guy like, hey, you're not one of us. Stop using Jesus' name. They they literally try to cancel the guy. Like, nope, you get shut down because you're using Jesus' name, and you're not one of us. And then they waltz back up to Jesus like they did something right. Like, hey, Jesus, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he's not one of us. And Jesus just looks at him like, what? <laughs> Don't stop him. Don't stop it. I mean, for no one who does a miracle in my name can turn around and say something bad about me the next minute. He's like, "Don't stop him." And then he says something that I think is so important. He says, "Whoever is not against us is for us." Don't cancel the guy. Don't shut him down because he's casting out demons in my name. He's probably not going to turn around and deny me. Guys, we cannot play into the cancel culture worldview. Every time, and I want you to think about this, every time we say that person doesn't have the right to say that or that person doesn't have a right to think that, we we are very quickly paving a path by which we lose the freedom to say what we think. Now, this is important, guys. There are some things that we can and should and must disagree with. There are some things in this world that we should fight and work against, but the reality is the minute we start saying you don't have the right, 
that can turn into a real slippery slope where a whole lot of people start losing the right. We got to be careful. There is nothing wrong with debating or arguing or challenging a person with beliefs with whom we disagree, but there is everything wrong with saying they don't have the right to think it. Eventually, that kind of canceling folds back on the people who do it. Finally, guys, I want us to remember something. Remember that some things are worth dying for. Some things are worth dying for. One of the fascinating things about Thomas More's life was that despite the fact that he did not live in a society marked by religious freedom, his faith was more important to him than his life. Thomas More didn't have religious freedom. but his faith was more important than his life. And here we are, a nation marked by religious freedom, and many of us are worried to be honest and open about what we believe. Many of us are scared. You see, Thomas More cared for and desired to serve the king. He really did. He died with great affection for Henry VIII. He really did. But... He cared about serving Christ more. Some of his final words on earth reflect this reality. I die his majesty's good servant, but God's first. His head was rolling on a platform 30 seconds later. He died for it. He cared for the king. He wanted to serve the king. But if it came to the king or Christ, he would serve Christ first. Paul said the same thing in a little bit of a different way. He said, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul wrote those words from prison, from prison for being a Christian. His freedoms had been removed, and yet his faith remained. Some things are more important than freedom, guys. especially for those of us who believe that this life isn't all there is. And in this nation, the thing is we have the freedom to live and believe as we choose, at least for now. But I just want to say this, and I, I, you know, I've been thinking about this all week, and I, just, I want to put it in your head and have you think about it. And you can let me know what you think. But if my faith in Christ doesn't remain in the absence of freedom... It isn't faith, it's a charade. Guys, if someday the United States of America tumbles from the heights of religious freedom down to the depths of religious persecution, we will see what our faith is made of. Is it real? Is it who we are? Or is it political and social expedience? Is it just a charade? Thomas More said to his daughter from prison, I'd be loath to think your father one of those people who can change his mind on matters of faith due to political pressure. And I hope the same can be said of us. If the moment comes where our freedoms are stripped, my hope and my prayer is that we will all say they can take my life, but they can't cause me to deny what I believe. Now, as we go this morning, there are a few next steps on the bottom of your outline. And I just want to highlight a couple of them real quick. The truth is we are in a contentious and challenging election season, as they really all seem to be. And the truth is, guys, every time you vote, you are exercising your freedom. Every time. 
And I just want to encourage you to exercise it. Whatever side you're on, whatever side of the aisle you may consider yourself to be on, vote. Express your God-given freedom. Express that. Research the candidates, figure out what you think, figure out what you believe, then go. Go vote. And while you're thinking about that, I want to encourage you in another way as well. The truth is we are called by Christ to be examples to the world around us, to exercise that freedom, knowing that we have the responsibility of sharing our faith with others. Right? And you have an opportunity. Right? We've got popcorn bags out in the atrium. We've got roots cards on the carts out in the atrium. You have opportunities to invite people to come and to learn more about Christ, to come to know Him. And I want to encourage you to pick some of those up and to do that this week. Because the truth is we all have freedom, guys. We have freedom to live out the faith as we so choose. And I just hope we will live it well. Knowing that we're free regardless of whether or not we're free in bodily sense. Let's live that freedom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for all that you've given us. We thank you for the hope that we have, for the joy that we have in serving you. And Father, we thank you for the lives that you've given us and the country in which we live that offers us the freedom to worship you freely, to assemble freely, to speak and write freely of what we believe. May we use that freedom to honor you. Thank you for this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This final song that we're going to do here is a song we've been doing for a little while here. And it's called Free Amen. What I can tell you is, is no matter what, Jesus has set you free. His truth has set you free. Relax your life in the grace of Jesus. Yeah.
Have a wonderful week. God bless you all. And never forget you are free.